Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Today, we're talking about the paleo thyroid solution. So many of you guys have been asking questions about thyroid health, what you do to support your metabolism, to support healthy thyroid function. So I have got a world expert. This is Elle Russ. She is a best-selling author, speaker, and coach. She is the author of the Paleo Thyroid Solution. She's also an actress and screenwriter of the award-winning documentary Headhunt Revisited. She used to host Mark Sisson's popular Primal Blueprint podcast for seven, seven years with 500 plus episodes and 20 million downloads. That's a very, very popular podcast. We've had Mark Sisson on this podcast in the past. Okay. She recently launched the L Rush show. Guys, great show. You got to check that out. She recently launched that. So go check that out on Apple iTunes and support her. And we're going to talk about the paleothyroid solution. So if you're interested in understanding why we have an epidemic of thyroid issues in today's society. If you want to know root cause factors behind poor thyroid function, if you really want to understand what you should be looking for when it comes to thyroid labs, like what labs are the right labs to get and what are the optimal ranges? We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about her top nutritional strategies, supplement strategies, things that she has seen work for hundreds of different people, uh, of of women and and other people when it comes to helping support their thyroid health and their overall hormone balance so they could thrive in life. So uh, you guys are in for a treat here. And Elle, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I love talking about this topic. (laughs) For sure. Well, let's start with your story and how the tragedy of my story and how you became an expert, you know, through obviously your own, your own um, pain, right? We always talk about the pain to purpose story and so how you overcame your own pain when it came to thyroid issues. So, you know, first off, it seems strange that someone who doesn't have an MD would maybe know more than people who do. And that sounds kind of crazy. And it did to me too, by the way, I was like, why do I have to figure this out myself? So what happened to me is that I started struggling and I'll go through the symptoms and let you know what happened to me, but I could not find a doctor in Los Angeles who could diagnose me properly. And then if they did assess it properly. And then if they even did that, if they would treat me properly, no one did any of those things. I went to over two dozen endocrinologists and doctors in Los Angeles. I spent $15,000. I didn't even have on supplements, bullshit, you know, appointments, all this kind of stuff. And the entire time I was just hoping a doctor, someone who was trained to be an expert in this would be able to help me. And they couldn't, they failed me, they misdiagnosed me and they left me in the wrong direction. So at one point I said, that's it, I gotta do this myself. Now, the truth is, is that the best-selling thyroid books have been written by patients. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not shocked. We really know how it feels. We understand how the thyroid hormones work and how they feel in our body and all of the different nuances. So what I really did was I went to, uh, at the time, um, I only mentioned two other books that I love on thyroid. One is called Stop the Thyroid Madness by Jan- Janie Bothorpe. She also has a website of the same name, probably one of the best websites for thyroid health. And she had a free uh, patient forum on Yahoo years before she did the website, years before she did the book. And these were patients like me dedicated to helping other patients find their way in this world. There were no podcasts then or anything like that back in 2006. And they guided me and kind of led me into a direction to help me help myself. So what I did at some point is I said, forget these doctors, I'm fixing myself. And I ordered my thyroid hormones over the internet. Shouldn't have had to do that. And I had to basically dose myself back to health. And I did. And then a couple of years went by. I'm thinking, oh, thank God that whole thyroid thing's over. That was terrible. And then I start to get thyroid symptoms again, but I don't even know that they're thyroid symptoms because I'm like, but I'm on thyroid hormone replacement. Maybe it's something else. Maybe I have a hormonal bath. Like a freight train, all of the 30, 40 symptoms that I had had the first time around came back. And what I had was what's more on the rise, which is called a reverse T3 problem. We can get into that later. So I had two bites, two bouts of hypothyroidism in a decade that I actually had to solve myself. The second one, crying in the parking lot in my doctor's office going, oh my God, I'm alone again. I'm alone again. I got to do this myself again, again. And now like, how am I going to find a doctor who understands this? And I even wrote in the book and my doctor at the time, who seemed very open, she was a DO. She is the doctor to lots of celebrities in Los Angeles and is very open-minded. She, when I told her about reverse T3 and I'm telling her how we might have to fix it. I did all my research. She looks at me and she throws her hands up and she goes, oh, Elle, this is too complicated. A doctor wow. said this to me. So I guess medical school wasn't complicated. I guess cancer is not complicated, but my, my 
in rivers. So this is what I really was just like, oh my God, I'm on my own again. But you know what? I'm glad I had to do it myself twice. I'm glad I went through both experiences. I happen to be one of only two authors probably in the world that are on T3 only, which is the last resort choice. So anyway, uh, I had to solve these two bouts in 10 years. I did both of them on my own without a doctor. And then finally went to go pitch the book to Mark Sisson. And then, you know, we have a doctor on the book as well, who, you know, obviously understands and agrees with everything I have to say about it. And there's a great Q and A in the back of my book, but let's start off with thyroid problems being, it's practically an epidemic. I mean, we've got 200 million people worldwide that have it, 25 million plus Americans for sure, but 60% are undiagnosed. Yeah. Now, I don't even know the percentage, but it seems like in my experience anyway, with patients all over the world, that like a majority of those people who are even on thyroid hormone replacement are not on the right doses, are not optimized, are not processing and metabolizing these thyroid hormones correctly, and they're still feeling yucky. So they go to the doctor and they go, I feel this, I feel that. And the doctor goes, well, it's not your thyroid because I'm an uninformed doctor over here taking the wrong test, doing the wrong things. We must have to give you Prozac or it looks like you need blood pressure medication on and on and on. So at every level, it seems as though the majority is uninformed doctors and it's really tough. And that's why I wrote this book and that's why I do what I do so that we can get everyone from A to Z without suffering. There's people that have suffered for 20 years. They went to the Mayo Clinic, they went to the Cleveland Clinic. And then it's like, I get their labs and the Hashimoto's antibodies are out of control. The T3 is zero and no one said anything about that. The Mayo Clinic, right. no, like, like, and you think you're gonna go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and travel across the country to go to the Mayo freaking clinic, the Cleveland and you think this reputation and, it, and it's the same stuff. So, so I'll stop there and then, you know, happy to explain anything about the thyroid or, or where we want to go. Yeah. And I would agree, you know, I've been practicing functional medicine for 12 years now, and I would say the medical system has really failed our society when it comes to adequately diagnosing and, and treating people with thyroid issues and really ultimately getting to the root cause. Yep. And fortunately, more and more people are becoming more educated because of people like you writing books. Um, and so thank God for that. But, uh, but it is a, a serious issue. So let's talk about some symptoms that ah, could yeah. clue somebody in that they may have an underlying thyroid issue. Okay. So this is disproportionately a women's issue. So men may be even more discounted. Uh, so for example, let me just give a man as an example. Um, I'll give I'll give an actual real life one. A 25 year old came to me. Uh, they had been put on testosterone hormone replacement. First of all, they're 25 and they have low testosterone right there. That's a red flag. You, you would absolutely be looking into why is that happening versus trying to patch it. So that's the Western model right there. So had the doctor just tested the thyroid, which is responsible for the production and regulation of the sex hormones, they would have discovered that he had a horrible hypothyroidism reverse T3 situation. So what we did is we worked with that doc to get this kid, uh, you know, his thyroid optimized and then wean off the testosterone because then the testosterone will come back. Now, if you're talking about a 70 year old and their testosterone is low, all right, mm-hmm. you know, that's legit. Maybe at that. Okay. So, but, so that's the problem. So people then will chalk up a domino effect of the thyroid, such as in a hormonal balance and want to throw progesterone at you or want to throw this at you. And it really is the root is the thyroid is off. So anything hormonal, So with guys, it would be like waking up without erections, trouble, sleep, recovery from exercise, low T type of symptoms, as well as the ones I'm going to mention for women. It also manifests itself gynecologically sometimes first. So you'll notice either it's a PCOS diagnosis, by the way, I was misdiagnosed with that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then, um, as well, anything like miscarriages, infertility, bleeding, endometriosis, clots, anything gynecological that's wrong, really heavy periods, you know, that last forever. Um, mine was that I just kept having my period at age 30, been healthy my whole life, healthy gynecological history in my family. I just started getting my period. Well, I didn't know any better. And the doctor just was like, well, let's take that symptom and give you the birth control pill to fix the symptom. Yeah. They never go. They never said, why was a healthy 30 year old suddenly bleeding? right? Then I got misdiagnosed. So I'm having all these gynecological issues. I developed a polyp in my uterus and a fibroid that had to be surgically removed. Thanks docs for leading me in that direction. I wish I could send them the invoice for that bill. Um, and so someone might say, well, what kind of dummy gynecologist would misdiagnose you? No, no, no. If you looked at the ultrasound, uh, David, you, you, you would say the same thing. We both would have concluded that, but again, no one's going, why? And so instead that doctor was just willing to treat me on metformin and all this junk without 
looking at why or what's causing it or what's behind it. And clearly it was my thyroid. I have not had an issue since. So those are some of the things gynecologically or with men. And then really what it is, is now it's very, very rare that someone doesn't have uncontrollable weight gain. Very rare. They will often have the other symptoms like exhaustion and brain fog Mm -hmm. and inability to focus, but, but it's very rare that some, so weight gain, uncontrollable weight gain, no matter what you do, you went keto, you're eating one grape a day. You're still gaining weight. You're like, what the hell? I just worked out for two hours. I feel fatter an hour after working out. I don't feel tight. I don't, that is hypothyroidism, Mm. thickening of the skin, a really gross thing that happens when you get hypothyroid, you kind of can't pinch a little bit of skin. You've got like thick, thickening skin. It's just as disgusting as it sounds. Waking up and having a puffy face and eyes, classic. Um, constipation, 100% classic. And I'm talking constipation to the point where like even laxatives won't do the job. You do clonics, you try to get this thing going, doesn't work, doesn't work no matter how much fiber you eat. Serious constipation. Um, the puffy face and things upon waking, that's one thing, but also it's going to be a major drop in energy. And this is not only just hypothyroidism, it's because when hypothyroidism, which is often not diagnosed and treated for a while, and they're suffering, trying to figure it out, your adrenals are suffering. You have no energy from zero T3. So now your adrenals are overexhausted and you have adrenal fatigue. What is that like? That's like waking up and it takes you three hours to even just get your mind together to do like one thing. It means you're overwhelmed by multitasking. Whereas before you were like, I got it, I got it. And now like thinking about just running an errand to the grocery store makes you want to cry. Mm -hmm. Um, Sensitivity to light, sound, and smells. This was so prevalent with me. I've had adrenal fatigue twice. Uh, It's one of those things where like you get in the car, someone's playing music and you can't handle it. Like you you viscerally like stop. Same thing with perfumes or smells. Um, I love essential oils. I love, I can't, couldn't handle any smells. Uh, and same with sounds. So like, for example, let's say you're living in an apartment building and like, suddenly you're up to your neighbors. You're like, they're so disrespectful, but you never noticed them before. So these things come into hand and play. And then you're the least fun person to hang out with, right? Like no one wants to hang out with you because you're tired. You're a party pooper. You know, you're too cold all the time. That's another thing too. So you have horrible temperature regulation because the thyroid is in charge of your heart rate, your metabolism, your sex hormones, and also your temperature. And we are like Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. So most people with hypothyroidism, when I was severely hypothyroid, I did not get above 96 degrees at all during the day at all. Um, so you are freezing now, right now, my hands and my feet are a little bit colder than my body. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't want anyone's hands and feet to be hot. Uh, everyone's hands and feet are cold. Don't think you have hypothyroidism because you just have cold hands. You know who you are because it's an internal chill. You can also test it at home with a thermometer, but it is an internal chill and you know who you are. Cause you're always cold and need a sweater when no one else is. And it's the middle of summer. That's, yeah. that's who you are. So those are some of the symptoms, cracked skin, hair falling out, yeah. uh, the outer eyebrows, uh, falling out. Um, yeah, that's what I, I was going to say, it's one of the things I always look at is the outer third of somebody's eyebrows. And that is typically a sign that I'll see often when, uh, when somebody has thyroid issues. Yeah. That's and the other thing, so I straighten my, if you're watching this, I, my hair is straight today, but I have curly mm-hmm. hair. You'll lose loss of curliness in your hair and yeah. it will just break off in the strangest ways. Like you'll wake up one morning and you'll be like, why the hell do I have bangs? Like what is going like just mm-hmm. weird stuff going on with your hair, weird ear stuff. Now, some of the ear stuff and like inner itching of the ears can be candida, but sometimes it's also just weird ear waxy, weird ear wax stuff that I can't explain. Like you feel your ears are drippy or weird. When I say this, people kind of know, but weird ear stuff, um, inner itching of the ears, which again could be candida, which can be fostered in this environment. Um, my gosh, there's over 40 symptoms in my book. I had like 30 of them, heavy legs. So this one's an interesting one and restless legs. This is usually related to ferritin levels. And also just FYI, if people don't know, sometimes tinnitus is related to low ferritin levels. And you wouldn't think a guy would have low iron storage, but my brother actually, who has no thyroid problems had tinnitus. And we discovered he had like zero ferritin. And after taking iron for a couple of weeks and some DHEA based on some other things, He was doing great. So, you know, sometimes these things are simple fixes, but heavy legs and restless legs. So restless legs is a real thing, man. It's so brutal. You are adjusting constantly at night. Like you can't get comfortable. You can't keep your legs still. This is not just normal rolling around. Like I do a lot in bed. This is something that's very annoying. Um, And then the heavy legs thing is brutal. And it's very obvious. So you're 
you're walking up steps and you feel like you are dragging like wood log cement blocks. It feels, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. It would be like doing two leg days in a row as an Olympic weightlifter and then having to walk up steps. Right. Um, So those are just some of the things, acne. So I had acne when I never had acne in my entire life. My face got absolutely disasters, dry cracked skin. And this is a weird thing, but it's often on the inside of the right index finger right here. It's dry cracked. And I don't know why it's this finger, why it's the right one. This has happened too many times with people, including myself to know. And it's one of those things where no matter how much lotion or whatever you do, in fact, this was the first symptom that I had in the reverse T3 or the first indication to me that, uh uh-oh, maybe it is a thyroid thing when I noticed that on my fingers. Um, So yes. And then of course, brain fog and loss of cognitive ability. So this is the biggest thing is we have more T3 receptors in our brain than anywhere else. So this obviously hypothyroidism has to do with mood. Yes. It makes you depressed. You're not just depressed because your body's falling apart. You're depressed. You got general malaise. You're just kind of going, why bother? What does it all mean? Kind of want to give up. Um, and the other thing too, is you feel like you're getting dumb. And this is something that's very hard for people to express, which is why I say it. Um, you will, so for example, if I stopped taking my thyroid hormone and became hypothyroid, I would start to slur my words probably like as if I had been drinking. And then also I would be dyslexic of the mouth. So I'm a very fast talker and clearly I'm going to bumble my words every now and then, but this was, it's like an undeniable, you recognize you can't find the words, you're saying them wrong. Um, you can't retain things. You literally feel like your brain is getting old and you're getting dumb. And the problem with that is that if you're above a certain age, you might just chalk it up to that, right? Um, I had uh, a friend who I was on an interview like this and she happened to be in, in my house and was just quietly over in the corner and she heard me talking this way. And I got off the interview and she was crying because she said, you just described what I was feeling inside. And I'm like, oh my, we've been friends for 10 years. I never suspected you have a thyroid problem. Well, we tested her Hashimoto's. So you know, these are things that are important to get out. And I want to just, uh, so, so those are just a few of the many, many, many symptoms that can come up, but they are debilitating. And so what happens is, is your body's falling apart. And if they're just trying to patchwork these symptoms, here's some Prozac that won't work after three months because you never got to the root. Here's a little bit of this, da, da, da. And then the other problem uh, practitioners make is someone will be suffering for a very long time. And then the doctor will be like, great, well, you need to detox from that and you need to do that. And you're like, great, what body is going to be able to manage that? Sometimes if it's gone on too long, you have to go on thyroid hormone to become unhypo so that you can then clean up the mess of the things that, right? And then you can maybe wean off of it. You can be on thyroid hormone for 10 years and get off it and have your thyroid recalibrate. It's not the end of the world. I know people are scared about that, but that's another problem too. It's like, how long have you been suffering? You can also nip Hashimoto's and nip this stuff in the bud with diet and lifestyle. I've seen people do it in eight weeks, literally eight yeah. weeks looked like a different person, mind, different person. Now, if that doesn't work, and that's what the paleo thyroid solution is about, it's not a gimmick like, oh, you got fat with thyroid, now use paleo to lose weight. What I want to important, you, you, you know so much about the ancestral paradigm. Here's the connection. Because it's a moderate or high fat, moderate protein, low carb paradigm, because of the way it works, it is the ultimate in adrenal management and blood glucose management in terms of a, a, a dietary lifestyle with those kind of macros. I'm not saying you have to eat red meat. And then that is so goes hand in hand with how the thyroid works. You know, when you're on that um, eating every two, three hour train and you're on a hypoglycemic carbohydrate dependent train, you know, your blood sugar drops, your cortisol shoots up. It doesn't like that. Then it goes down and, and you're going, and you know what, that is just counterintuitive to the whole program. So that is another reason to get with an ancestral paradigm and stop being carbohydrate dependent. The more insulin sensitive you are, the better this system is gonna work. And how can I prove that? Well, you can just look at the people that are edging towards type two diabetes. They often will get a thyroid problem. They go hand in hand. And if you have a thyroid problem, it goes on for too long, you're probably HbA1c is going to go up because you really can't process and burn fat and burn carbs. Um, and you can't just subsist off of eating, you know, an apple every day. Right. So, so it's, it, it's, it's an interesting place to be, but the paleo paradigm is conducive to having the thyroid hormones you either take or 
the ones that your body's producing for you because it works right, having them get to the places they need to go as efficiently as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and and to backtrack too, when we understand what thyroid hormone actually does, it activates the mitochondria within every cell. And your mitochondria will produce all the energy. And you have the most amount of mitochondria in your reproductive organs as well as in your brain, right? So your brain, you have roughly about 10,000 mitochondria per cell. Your muscle cells about a thousand, one to two thousand mitochondria per cell. So you were talking about brain fog, depression memory loss, right? Those mitochondria are suffering. They're not able to produce the energy they need. You're not going to be able to think right. Yeah. The Uh, neurotransmitters are going to be whacked. Absolutely. Totally whacked. Yeah. And so, you know, by the way, it feels horrible. I just want to tell everyone I'm better now. And I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm doing great, but I just want to tell everyone out there, I empathize with you. I cried multiple times a day, every day, could barely go out of the house, was so fat I could only wear sweats, embarrassed to be seen, horrified. Every time I bent my leg, it felt like I drank a bottle of MSG or soy sauce. It was so lonely and horrible. And to go through it and have to figure it out myself and feel left in the dust. And that's why I'm here to tell you, this is really the truth. This is completely fixable, which is why it's insane to me that all these doctors are uninformed because it's so easy to fix if you just have the right person guiding you. Yeah. It's felt it's so easy. And 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 then there's people that come to me and they go, I've been struggling to try to fix my hypothyroidism for 10 years. And you're like, oh my God, why? Because it, it should never take that long. Ever. Ever. That means you are in the hands of uninformed doctors. You're missing something yourself. So I just want to give everyone that hope because it's not like you know, people come to me, they go, oh, I'm the worst case you've ever seen. I'm sure you get that too. Like, oh, you're not going to be able to fix me. I've been, you know, and, and, and they're fixed every time. I mean, I, I really, the only, the worst case scenarios are the toughest ones to fix would be someone who's got Lyme disease, mm-hmm. uh, EBV flare up, they're in menopause and they're hypothyroid. Okay. Yeah. That's going to take a little longer, but I'll tell you this, if you catch it quickly, um, and let's say you can't correct it naturally, then at least you've spent eight weeks, 16 weeks, priming the body, cleaning it up, getting rid of the industrial seed oils or cleaning up the diet, going on some sort of ancestral clean whole 30 type of deal. And then if you do have to go on thyroid hormones after that, because it didn't work naturally, well, then at least you've primed it to accept those hormones and have them be metabolized properly and actually work. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if you're familiar with the cell danger response, but uh, in the cell danger response, basically like when somebody is overloaded with either trauma, infections, toxins, um, or stress in general, their cells actually respond and go into a, a sort of hibernation mode and become like resistant to thyroid hormone. So part of the idea of healing is uh, putting in stimuli to help the body realize that it's not in a, um, a state where it is being overloaded with stress. Right. And then kind of peeling out of, out from there so it can have normal metabolism, but that's kind of a story well, on that friends. note. Hold on on yeah. that note. So yeah, I want to highlight that. So let's talk about that being one of the causes. So people can get a thyroid problem from having a very stressful year. They often will get yeah. a reverse T3 problem. Totally. Um, and so let's talk about stress and how it affects. And I'm just going to personify the human body here for a second, but this is really sort of how it works. So let's say you're over-exercising, you're dieting, you're eating a low fat diet, like you're doing what I did back in the day and you're overworking out and you're doing all this stuff that sends a signal. You're not satiated. You're not getting enough nutrition. The body goes, we got to say that she's running from danger. She's starving. We're not going to give her any more of the fat burning T3 because she's in trouble. Yeah. So you got to worry about the messages that you're giving to this feedback loop so that it is working for you. Stress and high fight or flight, high cortisol, all that stuff is very, uh, it it really does because the body goes fight flight. And the only alert thing for them to do with your thyroid is to go trouble, trouble. We're going to not have this T4 convert into the active T3. We are going to dial it back. And this would happen also naturally, probably if let's say, Let's say I got into a horrible car accident tomorrow, knock on wood, and um, I had all broken limbs and everything like that. At that point too, uh, my body's going to adjust for that as well. It might be like, ooh, let's dial it back a little bit right now. It's a very elegant feedback loop. Always trying to save your life. It's like, let's not put gasoline on this fire because you got 18 broken legs. She's in flame. Let's maybe dial it back. Um, 
One of the things that they often test in the ICU is reverse T3. It is an indicator of wellness and unwellness in any human being. Yeah. And so anyway, I know I'm a little head on that topic, but just wanted to highlight that because it's- Yeah, I do want to go into lab testing for sure, but let's talk about what you find being the major root cause factors behind somebody developing hypothyroidism. Well, you know, they used to say that uh, they, they, they call the Midwest the goiter belt, you know, and they used to say that because people were getting goiters, meaning enlarged thyroids back in the day. And then they discovered, they decided to iodize salt and that mm-hmm. solved it. So did a lot of people in the Midwest have that because there wasn't enough of uh, iodine in their soil and food because they weren't near a sea? Oh, okay. Maybe, but that, that's sort of one way. We don't really see it come on into the archeological record until it was mentioned, I think like, I forgot how many thousands of years ago in China. And I'm not surprised that the emperor at the time was named emperor five grains. And I'm like, oh, if thyroid problems showed up then, there we go. We know the answer to that one. Um, First of all, the low fat craze of the eighties effed everything up, effed everything up for Mm -hmm. everybody. For everybody. And I think we know where we are now because we're seeing that type two diabetes is, an, is such a problem. So that our stressful lives, right? Um, lack of nutrients, lack of selenium in our soil. Um, I think just too much go, 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 a lot of over-exercising. And again, people being on the wrong eating and exercising paradigms that are sort of keeping them in a bad place, keeping them carbohydrate dependent. And right. so that's a big problem. And then of course, just being toxic. Listen, I had high mercury. Now I have since, you know, been detoxed from that, that could have caused it. That affects mitochondrial function. It affects reverse T3. Um, There are also people though, that actually don't have any proven resistance to T4, but it doesn't work for them. So there's people that you can't actually, uh, you know, it's just a matter of N equals one at that point, but usually you can detect it through blood work and everything else. And I'm happy to get into those tests if you'd like now, or. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the, the tests because most medical doctors are running TSH, which is really a brain hormone. It's thyroid stimulating hormones released from your pituitary gland, tells your thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. And then the thyroid gland produces T4 and T3, mostly T4. And T4 is an inactive form of thyroid hormone. And 93% of what the thyroid produces is T4. is T3. You've mentioned T3 several times. T3 is the active form. That's what actually turns on the mitochondria. Then the liver has to convert T4 into T3. The liver converts about 60% of it. You also produce that reverse T3, like you talked about, roughly about 20% of your T4 is turned into reverse T3. But in some cases, like if you have high stress hormone, you can turn in, you can, you can turn on more reverse T3. And then your gut, your gut microbiome actually converts 20% of the T4 into T3 acetate and what T3 sulfate um, and turns them into active T3. And so you need healthy liver, healthy gut. And so again, most doctors are just looking at TSH and maybe T4. Mm -hmm. What labs should we be looking at here? If you're out there and you have a doctor and you look at your labs and they've only tested your TSH and T4, you better run. You better run real fast. I have a friend, actually, she's in my first book as a success story, although there's hundreds since then. She uh, had two miscarriages, started to gain weight. She was always tall and thin. Her doctor's like, not your thyroid. Maybe you need Prozac. Maybe you need to eat less. Patients are always blamed for having some closet freaking eating disorder when the doctor doesn't understand hypothyroidism. And it turns out, we look back at over like 10 years of her medical history. Her doctor, A, never tested her for Hashimoto's. She has Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. Number two, kept her on T4, only tested her T4 and uh, TSH all those years. She was a disaster a disaster. In fact, by the time we got her to the right doctor, the doctor looked at her and said, if you weren't sitting here right now, I would think that these labs were coming from someone who just went through chemotherapy for cancer. Okay. Wow, yeah. Let's talk so about that's, how, that's how much an endocrinologist an yeah, indoctrinated crazy. endocrinologist can do for someone. And she laid in bed and cried for two days, didn't want to lose two babies as she did. And now it was too late to have more. And realizing that the past 10 years, trusting her endocrinologist was the worst thing. She, now she's doing great. She's on compounded T4, T3. The antibodies are down. She followed a paleo diet, got those antibodies down. She's doing great. Um, and she lives her life completely normal. Um, so yeah, so TSH, free T4, free T3, 
Reverse now, T3. What's the difference between T4 and T3 and free T4 and free T3? People, are, I'm sure, are so confused. free. Free on a test means like free, what's free and unbound and available in your blood right now. Now you still can use some total T4 and total T3, but I always say like eh, you don't need to bother with those. All we really need is TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and I'll get into those differences in a second. And then two Hashimoto's antibodies. Most doctors only test for one. You could be positive for one or the other. It's important to know and to eliminate this because there's other protocols and other interventions that you can do with Hashimoto's that you wouldn't do with someone like me who doesn't have Hashimoto's. And those tests are TPO antibody, stands for thyroid peroxidase. And the other is TG antibody, and that stands for thyroglobulin antibody. So yeah. I'm just going to repeat the six. TSH, free T3, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, TPO antibody, TG antibody. Now, those are the six main tests to just go, is there a problem with my thyroid? Would I suggest other tests like B12 and some others? Of course, vitamin D, yes. But just if like, you're only gonna take six tests to just see, that's yeah. what you take. Now, I also wanna mention, never go into this test other than in the morning. Okay. Go before 9 30 AM to get this test. Yeah. You go fasting. And I don't care if you're taking thyroid hormones or not. You do not take the thyroid hormones before you go in there. You're going to be late with your dose that day. It's fine. You can pop them in your mouth after the test because back to the free T3, if you have ingested something, it's, that's a more important suggestion for someone who's on any kind of T3. But if you're on a T4, T3 combo, uh, like NDT or anything else, then you swallow that T3 and because it's so fast acting and not the storage her hormone T4, then you go in for the blood work two hours later and it's gonna be peaking. It's gonna give you a false high, not what's free and unbound and available. That's what we want. Not what you just sent coursing through your blood. So that's mm -hmm. the difference. All right, so I'm gonna run down this thyroid feedback loop. You're right, TSH is not a thyroid hormone. It's just a pituitary uh, hormone. It's a signal, it's a wake up call and it shoots a signal because it senses when your body gets low in thyroid hormones. And so it suits out a wake up call to the thyroid. And you're right, the thyroid releases two hormones, mostly T4, which is the storage hormone for T3 and a little bit of T3. And T3 is the active biological thing. That's the package you want. Why, if that's the package we want, why doesn't the thyroid just pump out T3? Why is it bothering with this T4 middleman? And this is a very important thing to note about this feedback loop, it's so elegant. T3 is like the fire. It's like the gasoline on the fire. So you can look at T4 as like a slow release mechanism kind of dealio, right? Like it stores up and then as you need it throughout the day, it'll convert to T3 and whatever it doesn't need, like you mentioned, it'll wash that kind of out through a process called reverse T3. So it's always gauging, what do you need? Oh, nope, dial back, you know, oh, yep, put some out. Oh, she just worked out. TSH signal is going to be a 3.5 to go, hey, wake up, man, she just worked out for two hours, blah, 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 blah. So we have problems with the evaluation of these labs. And I'll just give the rundown. What does a normal person who has no thyroid hormone issues, no metabolic issues, what does their thyroid look like? If you have none, I could probably bet you a million ducks, bucks right now what, I, what yours are, because they're the kind of the same for everyone, whether it's Mark Sisson, Brad Kearns, or Joe Schmo on the street. The TSH will kind of be in the middle a little bit, maybe a little bit less. That's a fluctuating test though, so we don't totally count on it. We never use it as a sole measurement for this. Their free T4 will be about 1.31 on a scale of, let's say what, 0.7 to 1.7 or something like that, 0.8 to 1.8. It'll be around 1.31, that's classic. So around in the middle of the range. And then the free T3 as well, and this is different in every country, but middle of the range. So Canada might have a range of three to six, usually in the States, it's 2.0 to 4.0. So a normal person's thyroid, their free T3 will be at about 3.1. That's what a normal human who has no issues, that's what their thyroid looks like. Um, now, if you have uh, hypothyroidism though, and you are maybe just a couple of points below that mid-range on the free T3, like maybe you have a 2.8, 2.7, you could be discounted because someone goes normal. It's in the range. Well, mine was also in the range, but it was like 2.1 and the bottom of the range is 2.0. And you know this, and I'm sure your listeners do. It's not what's in the range. Is it optimal? I also, you can have B12 in the range too at 200 and be have it be a disaster, or you could have it at 800, which is better, right? So vitamin D, all these things. 
So, uh, so that's what yeah, a lot of these with. clinical ranges are very, yeah. very wide. And that's yes. because they're looking at, you know, this wide range of people that go to labs. And for years, people only went to labs when they had health problems. And so, uh, you know, these ranges are very, very wide. And so in functional medicine, we like to tighten these ranges and look at what is really optimal health? What is optimal health going to look like? And like yeah. you said, a 200 B12 is very low, even though it's, you know, quote unquote, within range. Right. And yep. so, um, so we really want to look at what's optimal, what's going to allow you to function at your best. Now, I just want to, we're not talking about hyperthyroidism right now, overactive, but I will say that let's say you have a free T, this happened because this happened for one of my friends. They weren't having thyroid problems, but they, they had their full thyroid tested and I took a look at it and I said, ooh, uh, your free T3 is like 3.5. Are you feeling a racy hot, which is pretty high for a normal person in the range of 2.0 to 4.0. This person has anxiety. This person has trouble sleeping. This person is very thin. We didn't do a TSI. We didn't see if they had hyperthyroidism, but it's interesting that part of their treatment for this anxiety issues were taking a low dose beta blocker, which is essentially what you would give probably like a hyperthyroid patient for, yeah. for a while before they corrected that. So that's something to look at in the other direction. If you're one of those people, and then you think like, I'm crazy, there's something wrong with me. And you'd be like, Hey, maybe you just have an overactive thyroid and this shit's just like yeah. too stimulating and giving you that anxiety. Um, all right. So that's, what's for normal people. So then how do you gauge it? If you are on thyroid hormone replacement, and this is where everybody gets it wrong. You know, it, it, this is, a, this is kind of a mess. So for P and I don't know if we want to get into all the different types of medications or, or what, but I could just run through by saying that there's only a couple of options for thyroid hormone replacement. The old school endocrinologist first order of business way is to give someone T4. Now, yeah. As we yeah. just spoke, the thyroid, that's not even endocrine mimicry because the thyroid does give some T3 out. Right. Um, and so this is what every endocrinologist and uninformed doctor will do. They'll immediately prescribe Synthroid. It often fails people though. And that's after a while um, that has happened. And although it can work, it's not an absolute never do it. It's just, I'm suspicious. And then the other, the second choice and the best choice would be a T4, T3 combination. Um, and that is using those two hormones in the right ratios. And uh, that could be either in the form of natural desiccated thyroid. It could be in the form of using Synthroid, T4 and Cytomel. These are the brand names of those yeah. together. And it also could be in the form of compounded, which is just sort of removing some of the fillers that might come in a Cytomel or a Synthroid for the very highly sensitive people or you would want to have a compounding pharmacy do it if you really need to have a, like a couple more micrograms here and there because you can couture it in the compounding pharmacy and you can't really break and cut and do all that stuff yeah, sometimes yeah. with the others. So really the ideal is T4, T3 treatment. The last resort choice is T3 only. That is the last resort choice. You do not go there unless you've exhausted all these possibilities um, pretty much there's, uh, sometimes there's a reason to go there directly. And that is what I take every day to survive. So given these choices, let's talk about how labs are going to look. If you're on T4 only and you're doing well, then your labs will kind of look like what I just mentioned. They, they actually will look very much like mm -hmm. someone who has a normal thyroid. Um, However, that's not the case for people on T4, T3 combinations or T3 only. And so this is where doctors then will go, oh no, oh no, we got to reduce your dose or da, da, da. So what I'm about to say is something we never target, but it's what happens usually when someone, because listen, there are some people, as you know, that just need a little bit. Some people need a sprinkle. They need like 15 milligrams of uh, uh, thyroid a day. That's it. And then there's some people who have to really overhaul and do full thyroid hormone replacement where like that's completely doing the job for them. But let's just talk about the people that are on some sort of significant dose, right? To, to make it a full replacement. The people on a T4, T3 combo will feel the best when their TSH goes down to about 0.01. .01. It's suppressed in some way. And this concerns a lot of doctors and I can explain as to why they are falsely concerned about it. So it'll go down to like 0 0.01. They're free T3 will be above the mid range and sometimes towards the top of the range. So let's say the top of the range is 4.0 and my friend Kara uh, needs to be at four point at like 3.9, you know, uh, everything else is great. T4 is good. TSH is 0 0.01. Most doctors would freak out and be like, you're hyper. We don't want it to get too high. That's when you go, are there overstimulation symptoms? What is the pulse? Yeah, yeah. What's the temps? Okay. It's different for everyone. I might only need 25 micrograms a day of T3 right now. I used to need hundred. 
There are people that need 75 twice a day. That would kill me, but that's perfect for them. So this is definitely an individual experiment, but that usually what is what happened when someone becomes optimized and completely symptom-free on a T4, T3 combination, then those are usually the labs. But again, I want to say that's for someone that's like on full thyroid hormone replacement. You never want to suppress the TSH when, when they're on T4 only, that would be a bad, bad call. That's a bad move. And so what those doctors that aren't factoring in is the conversion factor. And so let's go back to this TSH. Why would the TSH be 0.01 in someone who is optimized? Think about it because the signal has shut their mouth because it's sensed that you have enough thyroid hormone. It doesn't know, need to go scream at the thyroid. So it's shutting up. It's doing its job. It's like, no, you're good. You're good. Now, why do doctors freak out about the TSH being suppressed? This is really based on a very outdated 40 year old protocol back in the day when they used to try, they used, used to pummel patients with a bunch of T4 to try to see if it would get rid of thyroid nodules. And while that did, it made them hyperthyroid, probably even more, you know, their free T4 was probably way at the top. They started to have heart issues, some bone issues. So then anyone goes, oh, when the TSH is suppressed, that means heart issues, that means osteoporosis, blah, 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 blah. blah. And they're not factoring in that that was from pummeling them with just the storage hormone. So that's based off of an old, dumb thing that doctors used to do that no one does anymore, but yet that hesitancy and that false sense of being scared about a suppressed TSH is still there. The truth is, is that uh, also when somebody yeah. has like an autoimmune hyperthyroidism, like Graves, yes. their body, their immune system is attacking the thyroid gland. And like with Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroid condition, where the thyroid is being attacked by the immune system, and it's not able to produce thyroid hormone. Whereas with Graves, it overproduces. And then with that, we end up shutting down that brain response to TSH. So when you look at that pattern, you see low TSH, there's a different pattern than somebody that has already been, you yes. know, diagnosed with hypothyroidism and then is taking some sort of thyroid medication. Right. So I would be concerned if you were not on thyroid hormone replacement yeah. at all. And then you gave me your test and I saw a suppressed TSH. I'd probably see some other things too. That yeah. would be if, but if you just had the TSH and it was suppressed, I'd be fearful that you had hyperthyroidism. Right. If yep. you weren't yep. on any medication or if, and if you were on T4 only, I'd be very concerned that you were getting hyper or going to go into a reverse T3 situation. So, so now for people on T3 only, yikes, the labs get even more crappier for uninformed doctors. They really feel like you're going to, I've had doctors tell me you're going to kill yourself. You're going to have a heart attack. And the truth is, at least in my doctor's uh, practice on the book, he's been in business for 30 years. And he says that in his practice, the people with the suppressed TSHs has, have the best bone density. So all that stuff, again, it was just from the synthroid. It's not from the TSH being suppressed. Yeah. Um, Okay. So I am on T3 only and labs are going to look different for everybody and everyone's needs are different. There are also people, like I mentioned, that would be an exception to that rule on NDT. I've seen people on NDT or, or again, T4, T3 combination where TSH is suppressed, T4 is normal, T3, a little bit below the range. And I'm like, how you feeling? How you doing? But those people are like the Ben Greenfields of the world in terms of fitness. And, and, and then that makes sense. They're more T3 efficient. So Someone can be on an NDT and not be above the mid range. I would be asking them some questions to make sure they didn't need an increase. But again, looking at their physiological makeup and if they're feeling okay, they just might be T3 efficient. So again, we're not trying to target these numbers, but this is usually how it looks. So then T3 only is even worse for doctors because when you're on T3 hormone replacement, your TSH will be even more suppressed than 0.01. The T4 will be zero. It will be suppressed, which freaks out every doctor. And the T3 could be well above the range. If the top of the range is four, someone might be at five or yeah. 5.6. And that's where they need to be. Um, I had a doctor tell me once, she's like, you're overstimulated. And I'm like, how can you tell? She's like, I can tell by the way you're talking. I'm like, have we met? I've been talking fast my whole life, Joker. That is not a medical diagnostic that is not a diagnostic to right. say that I'm on too much thyroid hormone. It's just, it's just crazy to me. So, so anyway, so those are the way the labs are going to look. And so what happens often is a patient comes in, they're optimized on T4, T3 combo. They're feeling great. And the doctor goes, Oh my God, your TSH is suppressed. We have to dial it back. We have to wrong. 
Wrong move if you're on a T4, T3 combo. That's not the indicator. What would be more of an indicator to me would to see their T4 get high. That would be to me going, nah, now nah, you gotta, you gotta reduce something here. Okay. Now there's all sorts of way to dose too. There's people that take a little bit of T4 in the morning with some T3 and take T3 the rest of the day because they might have a reverse T3 problem. Sometimes people just take T3 throughout the day. Sometimes people wake up, they swallow one pill of T4. They're good for the whole day. Some people just wake up, swallow T4, T3. They're good or take it twice a day. There's so many different ways to dose. Everything is very individual and personal. Um, And to have someone who can guide you through all of those nuances is key. Um, I do want to make a very important point about patients and doctors making this mistake, a couple mistakes. You go to the doctor and you're like, hi, I'm working with this thyroid person or whatever. Can you take these tests? And first of all, they're probably going to be offended if they didn't already take them. But once you convince them to take them, then you go into the lab, you get your blood drawn and you get the results back and you realize they didn't test reverse T3 or they didn't test this or they test total PSA right now. Please check your doctor's work. You'll be in tears knowing that you just went all the way to lab. You just got your vein poked with a needle. Really? Now you got to go back. Now your doctor just failed you. How dare they? They said they would test everything. Yeah, I get it. Did you double check their Because if you didn't, that's on you. So please double check the stuff. Just because a doctor says that they are going to test something, oftentimes they don't. They go back to their office and they go, this patient doesn't know what they're talking about. I'm going to test this stuff. And they often don't test reverse T3 because they're too embarrassed to admit that they don't know how to evaluate it. That happened uh, once with me. So, So that's kind of an issue. The other issue is this. Let's say someone does need thyroid hormone replacement. The doctor will give them like You never, when you're dosing thyroid hormones, we don't ever just give a high dose, right? You start off low and you build up. You've got to build it up, especially if you're taking T4, it needs to build build up and store and kind of convert. So, you know, you do it over time, right? But really three weeks is enough to see what that dose did. A lot of doctors will go, here's your entry level dose. We'll see you in six months or a year wrong. Because what happens is now you've introduced exogenous hormones. You start shutting down that feedback loop. You actually in a month might feel even more hypo. You might get more hypo symptoms you once didn't have. Now you feel like now you're going, this stuff doesn't work. I'm not taking it. And it's all because of that dumb mistake. So if you do start on thyroid hormone, you got to get tested every three weeks until you get to your optimal dose, then you're good. And that could take three months. You know, sometimes people hit it right out of the park. Maybe all they need is half a grain or one grain, but if that's not you and you need to build up, then It's going to take a few months and you need to be on top of it. You need to be climbing the ladder in an orderly fashion. It's like taking two steps forward, 18 steps back. If you do it too long between each other and you will suffer. Um, And this had happened to me back in the day when I had started NDT, I did experience that I didn't up soon enough. And, um, that was, that was an issue. The other issue is that doctors aren't looking at iron storage and they're not looking at the iron labs. You will have problems raising your dose and getting to your optimal dose on any thyroid hormone. If you do not have proper iron storage, it is going to be problematic. It has to be there. Sometimes you have to do them concurrently. You have to be taking iron as you're dosing. I mean, you take them away, away from each other, but you have to be doing it on the way up. And that, that is often like to look at like red blood cells, hemoglobin, right? Yeah. TIBC, total iron uh, percentage saturation, ferritin. ferritin. Yeah. Ferritin is your storage form of iron. It's, it's really one of the earliest markers that you're going to start to see if you don't have enough iron. And, you know, for a lot of women, like you mentioned, a lot of, you know, women, hypothyroidism tends to be a lot more common in women. And uh, if they have a, a large, you know, if they have a heavy menstruation, their ferritin can get really low. And we like to see that ferritin up over 50, really between like 50 and 150. High ferritin is an acute sign of oxidative stress and inflammation. Yes. Um, and we so see that a lot that. as well, but low ferritin is, is a major issue with, again, not having enough iron. You need that iron to produce oxygen to bring to the cell. And if the cell signals that the cell feels like it doesn't have enough oxygen, it is not going, it's going to start to, again, have that cell danger response and now you're not going to get the thyroid activation. So they kind of work together there. I'm yeah. so glad you said that. It basically is like ferritin. You can look at as the conveyor belt to take your thyroid hormones to where they need to go. And if you don't have enough of it, it's, it's going to be 
a break in the mind shaft. You know what yeah. I mean? And so, so that's very important. And here's the thing. Then you get really weird symptoms. You just cannot climb up the ladder and get to your dose and tolerate thyroid hormones without it. So these are all really key yeah, and obviously yeah. vitamin D and all the yeah. functional stuff you would test anyway. Um, so some other reasons too, for low ferritin, are going to be like, if you're on a low iron, like a vegetarian diet, or if you're eating yes. a lot of processed foods and then also low stomach acid, which if you have low thyroid, you're typically going to have low stomach acid. You're not going to be able to absorb the iron and other critical minerals like zinc as effectively. And those are very critical. Zinc is very important for the conversion of T4 to T3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also too. So people will be like, I don't understand. I eat like liver, I eat meat. Yeah. yeah. So when I had low ferritin, I was hypothyroid. I was craving chicken liver from the chicken liver from yeah. the Jewish jelly, like every day. And I ate all of it and it didn't matter because at a certain point you can't, you can't absorb it. And at a certain point, you really do need the pill. You need to take that yeah. ferrous bisglycinate chelate. Like you don't have a shot. Yeah. Or, or a uh, betaine HCL sometimes too, right? Just right. Well, cause here's the thing. So your hypo, so to explain to people, I'm so glad you mentioned the digestion yeah. thing. So so you, when you're hypo, everything's slow, sluggish, right? You're yeah. slow, you're tired of cold, blah, blah, constipated. So you're chewing, you're producing less hydrochloric acid. So then you're not breaking down the stuff. And then your gut's already compromised because you got a yeah. gut issues when you're thyroid. And now, oh no, nothing is happening. Now, a lot of doctors will try to also treat the adrenals first. They're like, well, let's treat the adrenals and see if your thyroids come around. I've actually never really seen that be too successful because <laughs> usually the person's so far gone. Mm -hmm. um, or the other thing too, like, well, let's try to correct your gut. Your gut needs T3. Yeah, so yeah. Do your adrenals, your adrenal glands cannot produce cortisol without it. In fact, and this is such a rare thing, and most people in this world will never have to do this, but this author, Paul Robinson figured out a really interesting way to help people who had to take a, you know, like hydrocortisol, like had to take HC, uh, in the mornings or during the day because they had terrible yeah, cortisol, HC. almost no, yeah. yeah, not the digestive one though. Oh, Cortisol issue, hydrocortisone, is that? Okay, yeah, hydrocortisone, yep. There you go, yeah, the people with serious adrenal issues. Yeah. What he figured out is that if they woke up at between the cortisol producing window of like 4 and 8 a.m. for a person on a normal schedule, they would wake up at, at like 4 a.m., take their T3, go to bed. And that would help their adrenal gland produce cortisol and help them get off HC. So the and this is not for normal thyroid people. That is a very rare, random thing to do. Um, but at the end of the day, that just goes to show you the adrenal glands absolutely need T3 in order to produce yeah. cortisol. And also here's the other thing too. If you have too much cortisol, it's issue with getting T3 in the cells. And again, this goes back to that paleo primal, let's keep the cortisol and blood glucose and everything chill, you know? Um, and, and that's why this paradigm works so well and ancestral lifestyle too. You can't just eat the food and not do the lifestyle because you're going to be doing chronic cardio and you're going to be doing glycolytic workouts if you're on the old paradigm. And yeah. so I think a lot of people don't understand that paleo primal ancestral health is also about the lifestyle part of it. It's like not going over that Maffetone heart rate scale, like 180 minus your age, whatever that number is, you're not really going over that too much in workouts twice a week. Maybe you have a couple sprint sessions, but you, because you don't want to be in a glyc, you know, glucose burning phase, you want to be a fat burner. So often people are missing a component of one of these things here. It's not just a food list, right? It's a yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. And you really also have to support your liver and your gut too, because yes. that's where you convert your T4 into T3 is through the liver and the gut. And so if you don't have the right nutrients, if your liver is really sluggish or your gut, if you have dysbiosis or mm -hmm. chronic infections in your gut, you're not going to get the adequate production of T4 to T3, the adequate conversion. And it's a vicious cycle because again, it's like, which do you address first? And sometimes it can be an individualized case by case basis yes. based on other factors that are going on. But you know, all of this works together. And that's that's one of the the, the key understandings. And so let's talk about like your top nutritional lifestyle strategies for somebody that's dealing with thyroid issues. Go see a functional practitioner like yourself so you yeah. can get your op nutrients optimized. I once found later on after all of this that I had a CoQ10 deficiency. Right. I had a selenium deficiency. Selenium is an important factor in the conversion of yeah. T4 to T3. It also, when you have proper selenium, selenium levels, it helps with iodine. Yeah, iodine it reduces key. antibodies too. Um, it keeps your immune system under control. Zinc and selenium are really critical because 
again, you had mentioned earlier, most cases of true hypothyroidism are Hashimoto's or are autoimmune mediated, meaning the immune system is actually attacking the thyroid. And that's typically, although not always, but typically you'll see elevations in TPO antibodies and TG antibodies. Selenium and zinc are two of the nutrients that are critical for helping tame the immune system, vitamin D being another one, um, and keeping those antibodies under control. So in fact, when I was like the victim of a horrible wildfire here a few mm. years ago, and I inhaled all of the smoke for like 24 hours trapped at the beach kind of thing, I called my doctor right away. And the first thing I did, I went and joined a gym while crashing at a friend's house that had a sauna. I didn't even give a shit about working out. Just was like, I'm going in there and I'm sweating whatever I breathe in out every day. And what he also told me at the time, he goes, take extra selenium mm. right now. Yeah. Take extra yeah. selenium right now. Um, so selenium is very important. Iodine is important, but I would need to make this note that people look up thyroid and they see iodine's related. They go get some bottle Lugol's iodine. They overdo the iodine. You don't want to do that either. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, all of these things are important. Nutrient optimization, obviously becoming insulin sensitive, getting rid of carbohydrate dependency, cleaning out the crappy food. Yes. Um, you know, listen, there are thyroid support formulas that are nice that have a little bit of ashwagandha, a little bit of, you know, yeah. selenium, um, but you know, selenium 200 micrograms a day. Uh, there's a lot of forms out there, but I think at least as far as my doc said last time, I think the most absorbable form is the, um, SE methyl L selenocysteine, which I don't know how many people sell that form. I know life extension does. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, selenium 200 micrograms a day. Don't think you're going to get it from two Brazil nuts. Yeah. It's just like, if you have to, if you have to replace iron, don't think you're going to get it from liver or some natural Floridic stuff that comes from Germany because it looks lovely and it's a pretty bottle, but it doesn't really work. I've tried all of it. You know, many times I've had low iron, um, through the two bouts. I think obviously I'm a huge fan of sleep. I don't mess around when it comes to sleep, David. I do not, I do not mess around. I'm getting eight, nine hours every night. I think, uh, obviously you must not have young children. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Um, maybe I, yeah, I valued my sleep more than kids. So we've I got four that. kids under six in our, oh, our oh. Family, including a six month old. So yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're getting woken <laughs> up. Um, yeah. but yeah, as much as you can prioritize sleep, obviously exercise, all these kind of things, but the truth is really just to detoxify. Now you can go down this rabbit hole and with any functional doctor, like I just got a third heavy metals test just to check in, you know, you can go, what, what's, what's happening over here. What's happening yeah. over here? Organic acid tests. I once found I had zero serotonin and my doctor goes, this is like the serotonin of someone who's like crying every night and like up every night and like suicidal. I'm like, I, I don't know, but I had noticed a little bit of something mental. And I had noticed that the appetite thing was weird. and Instead of doing like an SSRI, we did like five HTP. I did it for like five weeks. Ah, done. Ah, ah. Who knows? So sometimes you can just do a natural intervention. Um, mm -hmm. And this goes, and this goes to, this is with thyroid too. You know, once you correct the thyroid, the depression goes away. Once you correct the thyroid, the lipid panel looks good. Once you correct, so you don't need to go on stents. Once the thyroid panel is good, your blood pressure is fine. That's high blood pressure is usually insulin resistance anyway. Yeah. So Again, please out there, stop getting patchwork. You're going to end up like a freaking quilt <laughs> um, and get to the root of this. Now, I, I've talked to so many people all over the world. It's the people that have been suffering for like ever and ever. And you ask them, you go, hey, look, do you want to like, you, here's the natural stuff. Maybe you need to hit this for eight weeks, 16 weeks, get retested. Let's see if anything's going to turn around. Sometimes people are like, I've done all the stuff. I did all the crap. It's been five years. No. I'm going at thyroid hormone. And then there are people that just need to learn that. And sometimes the natural stuff just works. There's people that are like, they just had a baby. Often when you have a baby, well, that gets thrown yeah. out of whack and you can become hypo. Um, just removing gluten. If you have Hashimoto's could just like yeah. change your life. If you catch this early enough, sometimes Optimizing you can- your vitamin D for Hashimoto's plays a big role. Yeah. And you know, I know we mentioned before, but let's just talk about ferritin. Usually that range is 10 to 150, 65 would be good. But like you said, if it's a little bit higher, that's fine. Um, if you're not take, if you're not taking iron and it's like really high, that's usually a sign, yeah. like you said, of inflammation and then vitamin D, right? If it's 30 to hundred, we're looking at 70 to hundred as being more optimal. Um, I'm in the sun every day in California. I still take 5,000. Right. I use the vitamin yep. D. Yep. I don't mess around. But particularly for people with, with Hashimoto's, 
So those are sort of my tops. I mean, of course, all of this other yummy stuff, our greens good or this, you know, it's, uh, we know all the healthy stuff, but those are the basics. And I think just getting a nutrient evaluation to shore up what you may or may not need in your life. And then also eliminating all these toxic elements. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's really, really great advice. And this has been a fascinating conversation and um, you have a great book, obviously, that goes into a lot more detail, a lot of nutritional lifestyle strategies to really focus on and prioritize. Paleo Autoimmune Solution, guys, definitely check that out. Paleo Thyroid Solution. But Paleo th- th- I'm sorry. <laughs> Paleo Thyroid. That was a different book, right? Paleo that's Thyroid right. Solution. Um, that's what you want. Check out her website, lrust.com, and her new podcast as well, The L Rush Show that you can go to Spotify or Apple iTunes right now and you can subscribe to that. So you get a lot more of her great, great content that she puts out. And uh, what else, what else do do you have to offer our audience? Well, I have a couple of free things that are so worthwhile. One is you can go to my website and click the free stuff and you'll get a free thyroid guide, which tells you these tests Mm -hmm. and a few more like the B12, the vitamin D, like what time you need today, you get to get them. It also tells you what questions can you ask a doctor's office if you haven't been Mm -hmm. there to kind of suss out if they even know it's not foolproof. But you know, if you call a doctor and like, we only prescribe Synthroid, you're like, click, I'm out of here. (laughs) Um, so, So do that. And of course, ways to find a doctor as well. I do want to mention that Stop the Thyroid Madness, uh, her patient-free forum, if you join, they do have a good doc list. That's a list compiled by patients throughout the country over 17 years in each state. And that might be a great way to find a doctor. But basically, you're looking for a functional, a true functional integrative medical practitioner. These are people that are going to be a little bit more knowledgeable, like yourself, who are going to understand these things. Um, and then the other thing I have up there is a free audiobook. And this audiobook is guided meditations and affirmations. There's two guided meditations, and one is for healing. And mm. it's very it, it's right. it's it's very similar to the one that I was going through reverse T3. It's real hard to get your mind positive and focus on the yeah. right stuff. So this is like a 20 minute guided healing meditation. The other is on on money, and then the affirmations are on confidence. But that's a free audio book you can download anytime. Um, and yeah, that's it. And then I coach people all over the world, not only in thyroid, but I run a, a I coach people in writing one on one because I'm an author and a writer. So whether it's helping someone, you know, finish a screenplay or a sitcom or a book or whatever, and um, also teach a confidence course because my second book is on confidence, and I also coach people in that too. So you can just find everything on my website and uh, reach out if you have any questions. Great, Elle. Well, I just want to acknowledge you for all the great work that you're doing, obviously solving your own health puzzle and uh, putting out this great content for people and helping empower people all around the world, take back control of their health, build their confidence. You're doing great work. So thanks so much for joining us today. And I look forward to having having you on the show again uh, in the future. So thanks again. And guys, we'll see you on a future podcast. Be blessed, everybody.